Ding, ding. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight. This is Don Kirchhoff. Um, he grew up on a 200-acre uh, farm in Wilson County. Um, his parents bought that when he was 10 years old. He's a lucky him. He got, got to grow up on the farm. Um, while leaving the farm after graduation, he uh, got his BA in mathematics at PLU. TLD or TLC then? <laughs> Got an MS in physics at the University of North Texas and worked towards a PhD in physics at the University of Florida. Yes. <laughs> Finding a line on <laughs> After graduate school, uh, John, uh, Don joined Schlumberger, where he worked in the oil industry for 16 years, followed by four years in the environmental industry. And subsequently set up his own business brokering firm for the last 20 years. When his parents died, he and his four siblings inherited the farm. None wanted to return to farming. Um, in 200, uh, 2010, uh, as a memorial to their parents, Don and his siblings embarked on an effort to restore the 200-acre property as much as practical to this native tall grass uh, blackland prairie that it once was. Um, Don would like us to uh, save our questions until the end. So if we got questions, keep them up here or on a piece of paper, and we'll get to them at the end. Don. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me to, to speak to you. This is sort of like uh, home, homecoming for me because my wife and I both graduated from Texas Lutheran. Uh, in fact, she spent a good bit of her childhood in uh, Joyce uh, Crane. Kramer families have 11 kids. Oh, yeah, yeah. our neighbors. They were in the yeah. went to school here. There were seven boys, most of them played sports here. Uh, Joyce was a cheerleader, and I, that's that's our background a long time ago. But today we're here to talk about this family farm where I grew up. And as we mentioned, I, my parents bought this in 1954. I was 10 years old at the time. At the time. My uh, siblings and I grew up picking cotton, frozen corn, hauling hay. We did all the work that farm families did in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And by the time we graduated from high school, we had enough farming. And our parents encouraged us to go to college. All five of us did. We got degrees. We pursued our own career. Um, years, decades passed. We got older. Our parents got older. And when they died, we got the farm back. We inherited it, but we didn't want none of us wanted to return to farming, so we did what uh, Sandy said. We decided in our in our parents' conservation ethic, we would restore the property to the tall grass black land prairie that it once was. And that's uh, let's see, right. <laughs> hey Bruce, we're having a little trouble with the sound. It's cutting in and out. Stand closer. Yeah, we can't stretch it as good. Guess them. If I punch an arrow, that will that do it? Yeah. <clears throat> oh, actually, why? Because we're not seeing. Okay. All right, so what we're going to discuss today is the process that we went through for the last 10 or 12 years some of the resources that were required to restore this property, uh, the role that volunteers that play to make it work. And then we're going to be looking at the results of all the various things that we did. Okay. All right, this was our starting point. It's a 200 acre property. Um, there are these, these dark areas right here or what we call pasture in those days. Naturalists who've come out there uh, call those that riparian areas. There are 
uh, 30 acres of riparian forest and 170 acres of row crop farmland. So that was our starting point to restore to a prairie. And our, our process went something like this. The first thing we did failed. Um, we thought we would just take 10 acres and buy some expensive native seeds and plant them with a grain drill like Daddy would plant any other kind of grass. And we did that. And we looked eagerly at that field month after month for a year and absolutely nothing happened. We, we couldn't identify a single native plant. Now it was a drought that year, so we figured, well, drought conditions caused it. We did the same thing the second year and got the same outcome. So we began to realize that you just cannot plant a prairie. It's a lot more food than that. So we, the next thing we did was got some advice. Yeah, so we sought some professional advice. And we were advised to start small. We need to learn how to uh, restore native plants, learn how to get them to grow and then move up to fall, uh, full scale. And during the process that we were doing all of this, during the time we were doing all of this, we also wanted wildlife to come back, not just the plants. So, so here's what we did to start small. We were advised to travel around Wilson County and locate remnant stands of native plants. And we did that by finding old cemeteries, abandoned railroad tracks, old bridges um, and, and look for native plants, collect the seeds, grow seeds in some trays where we have a controlled environment, and then plant those seeds to a controlled environment on the farm. And uh, that was basically the process that we went through. And it looked something like this. We looked for places that looked undisturbed. This was an excellent old, old cemetery in Wilson County that we located. You can see on the bottom of this frame, there's three statues that we can see from the road. Now, this was on private land, so we didn't go out there, but this was an area to look because on the roads, the creeks, the river, uh, the bridge crossings, and so forth, that's where we were finding native plants. Now, you got to remember, by this time, we'd been away from the farm 30, 40 years. So we didn't know the difference between a native plant and an introduced plant that we didn't work one on the prairie. So what we did was we would take photographs of plants like these, or we would take clippings, and we would send them to Chris Best, the state botanist mm -hmm. at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services in Austin, and he would tell us what we were finding. Uh, you would say, stay away from this plant. You don't want that in a native prairie, or this one over here is good. And we would mark their locations, and we would watch them as they produce seed. And when they produce seed, we would collect the seeds, uh, take these seeds to our homes, and planted them in trays, and we began to be successful. We learned that we could find these plants. We could collect the seeds. We could put them in trays, and they would grow. The next thing then, next step was then to take these plants and get them to grow on the prairie or on the farm. And, and what we did here, we, we took this old cow pit. It was about an acre. And during that year that we were collecting seeds and growing them in trays and learning how to propagate them, we were also plowing or disking, actually, this, uh, this cow pen. We would disk it, it would rain, and millions of weeds would come up. And we'd disk it again. We did that about four times over the period of one year. And the purpose for doing that is to deplete the seed bank of undesirable seeds so that when you finally put a plant in there that you want, it has half a chance to survive. So, it, so on the bottom of the very bottom of the picture, you can see the black hose. We, we put in drip lines, and on top of the drip lines, we put that uh, weed barrier, and then we poke holes through the weed barrier, and you can see the two rows on the left that are we've transplanted the seeds to, and uh, we did several rows of that with the grasses we had located, and, and, uh, and in months, we were really successful at this, too. We, we learned that we could do all these things and we could get to the point where if we change the environment enough on the farm that we could get the native plants to survive. And on the other side of the cow pen, uh, we were we planted the forbs. And again, very successful. These plants grew, they flowered, they made seed. Uh, we bought some books on how to separate the seeds and, and uh, screen them. We built some screens. 
And we began developing quite an inventory of seeds of, from of native plants that were not available commercially. So we were developing our own seed supply. And at this point, although on a very small scale, we learned enough about how we could get started and apply what we learned on a large scale. Now, we, and so we were ready for full scale restoration of 170 acres. And when we look back over what we did, that process really had three phases. The first phase was preparation. Remember, we had row crop farmland, been disturbed by human beings for one or two centuries. The conditions were nothing like what the native plants grew in a century or so ago. So we knew that we had to do preparation of those fields. And I would submit that that is the most important of all steps. If you don't get this right, you won't get a prairie because the conditions are not what they used to be where native plants could survive. So after preparation, we had the planting events, and after we had all the property planted, guess what? We started having a prairie, but it needs to be maintained. And that's a lot of work because we have a 200 acre postage stamp floating in thousands of acres of farmland and ranch land all around us. Again, I mentioned this is the, with our starting point. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to stand closer to the speaker, but one of the fields, there were three kinds of fields here. One of them is in the upper left-hand corner, that green area, and then there's another little green patch in there. That's coastal Bermuda. That was one type of field we had to get rid of. Then on the left, lower left, there's a long brown strip. That's where our parents had run cattle for decades and made hay. So that was a different kind of environment. And then all of the rest of that area, which is sort of gray, that was row crop. And uh, that was another type of environment that required a different type of preparation uh, to plant. So here's, here's how we prepared those fields. The coastal Bermuda, if, you, if you've tried to kill Bermuda grass, that is difficult. So we, we grazed it really heavily, tried to kill it just through grazing for about a year. And as we approached that summer, hot and dry months, we sprayed that field three times with, with glyphosate. And even that didn't kill all the coastal Bermuda, but it suppressed it enough so that we could have, we could plant them. Now the, the pasture grass field that had been grazed for so long, it would have had billions of seeds in it. And we knew that because that was the area we had failed miserably after two years. And we were advised, just give those acres to the renter who was renting all the other property and let him use his modern farming techniques and deplete the seed bank in, in that strip of field. What, what he was doing was planting Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready maize, and spraying the heck out of it about three times a year with, with remedy, with uh, Roundup. And that killed everything, but but it created a seed bank that was severely or significantly diminished, which enabled made it possible for a planting of data plants to be successful. And then the row crop fields were the easiest of all, because that's where the the farmer using modern farming techniques had already depleted the, the, the seed bank. And all we needed to do was plant in the in the corn or maize in the yard of his last harvest without even disturbing the soil in any way. Disturbing the soil would bring seed up that was buried and w would not normally come up until it got brought closer to the surface. So we had our coastal Bermuda fields were robust. They were beautiful. Our neighbors thought we were nuts to try to kill uh, coastal Bermuda that our dad had worked so hard to get in place. but. Uh, and you know what beautiful maize and cornfields look like in the deep black soil. Well, we killed all of that. And our goal was to have, at planting time, a sterile field. Nothing growing, didn't disturb it, just plant directly into the stubble left by the, the, the last harvest. And then that brought us to our planting events. That was going to be expensive, and we needed a lot of assistance for that, financial assistance. And for that, we went to the Natural Resource Conservation Service and we applied for a WIP grant, Wildlife Habitat Improvement Program grant, cost sharing. They paid half the cost, we paid half the cost. And uh, of course, we got good advice from them. Um, they provided the seed mixes that we used. We purchased all our seed from Douglas King Seeds in San Antonio, and we planted with a no-till drill, about the grain drill, 
that, that just doesn't work. It has to be a no-till drill that mimics what happens in nature. Seed falls on the ground, wild animals perhaps stomp some of the seed tightly into the soil to get a tight soil seed contact, and they emerge from that kind of a condition. Um, we had four planting events over a period of three years. Two of them were in early May, two were in early September. The conditions following planting were different every time, and the outcome was different every time. Uh, what the, the weather conditions after the planting event pretty much drove what population was going to succeed uh, that first year. The planting events basically look like this. This is my brother Scott, who planted most of this field here, and here he is checking to see that the planter was dropping seed for, properly. Now, this is a, a very interesting photograph. Look what Scott's finger is flicking up. It's flicking up dry dirt. So both September events, we planted in dry dirt, and we got lucky both years. Within one week, tropical systems began coming in. We got good moisture uh, throughout the fall. And in, in one particular field, in only its second year of growth, the switchgrass was nine feet tall. So in this environment, this black, deep black soil that we have in this area, when you get the conditions right, uh, you, 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 we had this in two years. And we didn't have just switchgrass here. This picture shows just switchgrass. But in, when, when wet weather followed our planting events, this was our experience, almost every time the seed came up. So there's high biodiversity, and you'll see some of that in some of my other pictures with real sharp grasses, medium height grasses, and, and the, the big four that they're called. So now that we have 170 acres planted, we, we've moved into maintenance, which is going to have to continue in perpetuity. The, the prairie is going to have to be maintained to sustain it. And the biggest surprise we had were the invasive species. Because there is so much old world blue stem around, and we have plenty of the woody invaders like Bacchus, uh, Wesatch, and Mesquite, these are constant problems. Uh, so one of our management techniques for the, uh, to sustain a prairie has got to control these invasive plants. Another technique we're using is prescribed grazing. That is, we're using the neighbor's cattle to mimic buffalo herds bring them in at a specified time for short intervals, concentrated grazing to, to mimic buffalo herds. Uh, we're also ma uh, making hay. Hay is our major revenue stream. That enables us to keep the prairie financially self-sustaining. We would love to use fire. There's a lot of evidence that fire is not going to work well in South Texas. There's evidence that suggests burns favor invasive plants over native plant recovery. We're not sure about that yet, but we are, so we are engaged with uh, the Texas Park for Wildlife Department on control burn tests to try to answer that question. <clears throat> now, this is a very interesting picture for what it tells us. This picture is taken when this plant, this field has three years of growth. This is the beginning of the fourth year for this plant. And I'm going to walk a little bit away from this microphone because I want to point that these, there's a lot of small plants in here, sharp grasses like buffalo grass and, and some gamma grasses that don't get a few inches tall, and there's some forbs. There's also scattered around here plant, plants like these, the medium height grasses, uh, four flower trichloris, silver blue stem, um, long flat silver blue stem. And then that tall brown grass on the left is a switchgrass. You see another one close to the gator. And then in the background, you see a lot of switchgrass. That's what we had after, after three years of growth. But what really stands out in this picture is all that green stuff. That's backwards. And in those first three or four years, that was our biggest problem. Anywhere the prairie is not yet robust and the grass population dense, there's some bare dirt. And where there's bare dirt, dirt you get all kinds of stuff come up. And in our example on our farm, backless was the worst for the first four years. But we could control that with 2,4-D. Problem was that a lot of the, and we did spot treating, we didn't do it broadcasting, because if we would have, that would kill all of the 
wildflowers and the farms that we wanted to grow as well. When the backers, the backers would get eight or nine feet tall in one year, mm -hmm. and it would completely choke out in one year everything that we were planted. So we had to control that. If it got too big, we would shred it. It would green out and we about a, a, a foot height. It was really tender, and it didn't take much two four D to kill that. So that's controllable. The wrong way. Sorry. The, the next significant woody problem we had is with we satch. We satch like backwards comes up anywhere can find a little bit of bare dirt. And thank God for master naturalists. The Alamo area master naturalists, they came out repeatedly and helped us control these these young little uh, we satches that were coming up. Here you see a couple using uh, loppers, cutting off at the ground. We would treat the little stump with a remedy diesel mixture. When the weasats got a little bit too big, we'd go after them with power tools. This is my sister Brenda using a brush cutter, or we would use a pole saw to reach under these uh, six or eight foot trees, uh, cut them off at the ground, treat them with with a uh, remedy and diesel mixture. And then one year, the one area, the weasats just got way ahead of us, and we had to hire this contractor to come out with this device, and he pulled these trees out with by the roots. Now we stacked all of those, made nice piles, nice. Uh, bird habitat on the prairie, but that's a pretty expensive way to make bird habitat. <laughs> Try to prevent that. But if we really kept at it, this is what we had at the end of four years and the fifth year and so forth. It's really a beautiful prairie. And um, you know, with a point where I could get a little closer and show you in here, there's a lot of short grasses, some I've already named, and then the medium height grasses, and then the big four. And then on our property, that's predominantly switchgrass. The, the big blue stem, little, well, we have quite a bit of little blue stem, but big blue stem and Indian grass, we don't yet have much of that. We haven't quite figured out what to do to get a good population of those. Another of the management tools we're using, I mentioned, is uh, prescribed grazing. And to accomplish that, we needed to divide the property in with cross fencing. So we applied for a grip, that's grassland uh, rehabilitation incentive program or something like that. Uh, uh, that was a cost sharing grant we got with Oaks and Prairie Joint Venture. And they helped us build these electric fences. So we divide the property into five big fields so we can bring cattle in, a bunch of cattle in a small area, graze it all down like a buffalo herd would, and then move the cattle over to another field or completely off the property. And we're lucky here because the neighbor had plenty of cows just right across the fence and he's eager to have his cows eat some of this native grass. Because they come over there and they get shiny and beautiful. But he's got to take them back when we, when we say he, he doesn't. Yeah. And, and that's the kind of a sensitive thing because those cattle love some grasses more than other grasses. And they will eat it down to the ground. And if we're not careful, they will they will damage some of these not native grasses. Another management tool we're using is making hay. I mentioned earlier, this is our largest uh, revenue stream. Uh, and these grasses, when they get big, uh, make a lot of hay. And, and when the native grasses get dense, that's a lot of hay. And here Scott is taking out some samples so we can do some nutrition and testing. And then fire is what we would really like to use because that's what nature used. But the conditions that exist today are not the same that existed 200 years ago. So we're doing a test burn with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. We set aside four fields and four patches. Each patch is three acres. In year one, we burned one acre in each of the four patches. In year two, we burned that same one acre plus the acre next to it. The third year was summer before this half summer. It was last summer. We were supposed to burn all three acres, but it rained too much last year. Uh, last year. This year we didn't burn because it was too dry. We were always under a, a fire, fire burn, burn, yeah, burn, burn ban. ban. Yes, burn ban. And Texas Parks and Wildlife wouldn't light a fire on private property under burn ban. So this this test has never really been thoroughly completed. Now, while we were doing all of this, we wanted to do many other things that brought wildlife populations back. Remember, the farm had been. Uh, formed uh, using modern farming technique 
which absolutely created a monoculture. When my siblings and I would go visit our parents, that place was dead. There were no quail, no purple mortons, virtually no butterflies unless they stumbled across the area. So we wanted to bring all these wildlife back. And to accomplish that, the first thing we did was apply for a PFW grant from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services that was Partners for Fish and Wildlife. It was a 50% sharing uh, grant. Those first three projects were our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services project. We installed three wildlife guzzlers, <clears throat> three burrowing owl roof sites, a 50-foot wide green tree pollinator fire break around prairie headquarters, and uh, 10 diversity plots, five of which were fenced in to keep the deer out. And following the clock following a little bit, after we'd had the prairie for several years, we noticed all this native grass encroaching from our neighbors on the south. The prevailing wind was blowing native grasses on the prairie. But we noticed that along that south fence line, there was about a 50 or 100 yard interval where we weren't seeing invasive grasses because in the fence line, there was a bunch of brush growing. So we figured maybe we can slow these seeds down with a windbreak. And we applied for and did get a grant to, cons to plant a 100 foot wide windbreak along the south fence line. The first 50 feet is uh, woody pollinators like the fire break around headquarters. And then inside of that 50 feet of, of uh, tall grass. And then more recently, the uh, about just about four or five years ago, <clears throat> the state botanist with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services brought us some manfreda seedlings. I uh, never heard of manfredas, but he told us a little bit of the story how important they were. We planted some around it, and they were working. And that progress, now that that uh, project has progressed substantially. And then this time last year. <clears throat> An Alamo, Alamo Area Master Naturalist who had been volunteering for about a year uh, noticed some bird boxes we had there, and she proposed a nest watch project. But let me get more into each one, into more detail with each one of these. The first of these wildlife restoration projects was was an Eagle Scout project, and the Eagle Scouts from Laverne installed uh, three wildlife guzzlers. What a guzzler looks like? It's a roof out there in the prairie gutter collects water de delivers it to a storage tank and then the storage tank delivers it to that guzzler in the ground and we learned very quickly you build it and they will come i mean it was just amazing i mentioned earlier we hadn't seen quail in 10 or 15 years within two years of getting a diverse plant population back the quail came back and they came back in large numbers and, and they loved the guzzlers and uh, this, it, along with the, the, the quail and other small animal rodents, came the, uh, the the bigger predators. This picture was taken by a game camera in April of this year. So big old bobcat bought himself a rat, came in front of the camera for his picture to get taken. <laughs> and we see baby bobcats every year now for at least five years, right, right at the house. The, the second of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services project was to construct three burrowing owl roost sites. This also was a an Eagle Scout project. We had seen burrowing owls rarely, but occasionally on on the property. And the, the this design that the scouts used is they took a 55 gallon drum, cut it in half, buried it, and then connected that cavity with a, an eight, eight inch flexible line to this surface. They built three sites. Each site had two burrows. Each burrow had two entrances. So that was, that was the design. And again, we learned that you build it and they will come. But what came to these burrows was not so much the burrowing owls as all the other animals that lived out on the prairie. Armadillos, possums, skunks, uh, ground squirrels, snakes, rodents of all kinds. And they came in and they they rearranged the furniture. They, <laughs> they dug holes in the tubing, filled the, the tubes with dirt, eventually filled the cavities with dirt. The holes never really got in there, but a lot of other animals did, and the predators knew it. The camera every once in a while would catch a bobcat reaching on the inside. 
or a coyote trying to dig in to, to get something to eat. So after about five years of this, we figured that that design wasn't going to work on our property, although it works a lot of other places. So we um, were, some pipes were donated to it. These are eight inch pipes. And we built one uh, burrow that's in the shape of a T, two of them were elbows, and I think there's six more that are just straight pipes, all of these in place. Now, the, the first one, we started with just one in uh, 2020, a year and a half ago. And again, this is volunteers put this in. These are volunteers from the Alamo area, master naturalists. So with our tractor and the front end loader, uh, we could dig a hole and get those pipes in the ground. The end, and the ends of these pipes, we put uh, predator exclusion fixtures so that size so that an owl could get in, but most of this larger predators cannot. And again, we find you build it and they will come. By this time, we knew that the migratory owls showed up like clockwork. The first day in October, they were going to be there. So we got this one pipe in at the end of September 2020. And in less than two weeks, we, we had our owl there. And he spent the whole winter there in, in 2020. And the, the success of this, got the word got out, and there is a raptor rehabilitation center in Dallas. Someone had, or they had found a paralyzed burrowing owl, and they had rehabilitated it. It could fly. And we got this call one day, said, we got this owl we'd like to release in one of your burrows. We said, bring him down. They drove from Dallas with this little owl and, and released it in, in our burrow. Uh, but it, like the other one, left in February because all we've attracted so far is just the migratory owl. Our goal is to get residents to stay and, and, and reproduce there, but that hasn't, hasn't happened yet. Now, during this past year, we're reading about what other people are doing. Texas Parks and Wildlife has had some success putting artificial owl poop at the entrance to their, their burrows. They've taken, taken rocks and uh, painted them with uh, white latex paint. We did the same thing, hoping that when the first week of October came around this year, some owls would stay. Well, we know the owls came because they, the owls left uh, owl pellets at three different sites. So we knew where they were there. And Carolyn Wolfer, who's not here tonight, but she's a member of your, your group, uh, she and I were on the prairie one day on the first week of October, and there was, we're pretty sure it was the owl on one of the T-posts. You put a T-post at every one of these because the owls like to have a perch. But the sun was behind the bird, and we didn't get a positive identification, but we think we actually saw one. But we did see three owl pellets. Uh, make a long story short, I don't think they're staying this year because it's so dry. There's probably not enough food for them, not enough water, and they, they moved on. But we've got next year and the year after that. Uh, our third U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services project was to plant a 50-foot wide green tree fire break around Prairie Headquarters. Um, we purchased 2,300 pollinator seedlings uh, from a grower in South Texas. Um, there were 15 species. And again, volunteers planted all these. On planting day in October 2013, we had 91 volunteers from Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and 4-H clubs in Wilson and surrounding counties, and they planted all uh, 2,300 seedlings. Oops, nine years later, oh, this is what this is what a planting day looked like. I mean, if you want to see 91 people on a small farm, you should have been there that day. It was people all around the house planting these plants. Then nine years later, uh, in this year, that's what those one inch tall uh, pollinator seedlings became. Eight, nine, and 10 foot tall bushes, 15 different species. And these are now serving the purpose for which they are intended. That is the bushes are big enough, they're making enough shade. So grass is not growing underneath them. That robs a fire of any fuel. So the a prairie when it catches on fire can burn up to this and hopefully not burn through it, or at least not get through it very fast. But another really interesting thing about uh, pollinators like this, 
is the wildlife that it attracts. I mean, this gets full of birds and butterflies and spiders, and insects and bobcats. And it's just interesting to sit and bring a camera and see what's growing in there. Our fourth U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services project was to plant 10 diversity plots, five of which were fenced to keep the deer out. Uh, we needed 6,000 seedlings, and here we reverted back to what we learned at the very beginning of this effort. We went around the county roads, we collected native uh, seeds that we could find, we bought others. We uh, had volunteers come over, the little piles of dirt, we, we mixed uh, soil with, with uh, uh, not perlite, but the other one. Vermiculite, that's what we used, yeah and olive coat in there, and we planted 6,000 cells. My sister and I built these uh, nursery tables, and those 6,000 seedlings we planted in our diversity plots. Those plants grew, they flowered, uh, produced seed, and then the seed are distributing out of these uh, planted areas to populate the prairie with a variety of native plants. Oops. Okay. And then fast forward on the clock about five years, and we begin to learn just how significantly our prairie is being invaded by these non-native species, seed blowing in from our neighbors to the south. And I mentioned earlier, we saw that in an area where there was brush growing in the fence line, we weren't having this problem. So we applied for a GRIP grant, which enabled us to Planted 55 foot wide strips, 1600 feet long along our south fence line. Again, this was accomplished by uh, volunteers. And then the inner 50 feet, we would find tall, tall grass, all to slow the wind down, get that seed to drop out instead of blowing onto our property. Of course, we won't know the outcome of this for another five years because this was planted in October two years ago. To accomplish that planting, these seeds come in cartons like that, and every carton has just one type of plant in it. So ahead of planting, we got to randomize 2,300 seeds in a whole bunch of trays and, and be prepared so that when the planting roots comes out, uh, we can go to work right away. We also, uh, for preparation, we, we plow uh, 21 inch deep furrows which with our with the tractor and the subsoiler, which facilitates planting. But I think the most important thing from what we were told, it enables these sharp one inch, one, uh, one foot tall seedlings to rapidly get a tap root down. So when drought comes along, these plants that survive, well, that's exactly what happened on this planting event. I mean, we just barely had them in the ground and it stopped raining for more than a year. We're not even sure what percent uh, success rate we have. At any rate, we were ready for planning day then. We had 50 volunteers come up for this event. These were the 4-H clubs in Wilson County and mostly Alamo area master naturalists. You go out to the field and all day long we plant 2,300 seedlings in this 600, 1,600 foot long strip along our south fence line. Then in 2017, uh, again, Chris Best, the state botanist at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, he said, I've got some Manfreda seedlings I'd like for you all to try on the plate. We learned later that Manfreda is really a, a rare plant. Uh, cultivation, animals, deer have pretty much decimated the property, uh, the plant, not just in Wilson County, but I think all over the state. So we he brought us about 40 seedlings and we scattered them out and they're doing quite well. And then one day in 2021, I get this call from a TSU student, turned out to be Carolyn Wolfer, who's in your chapter. She called up and said, hey, I understand y'all got Manfredas on your plant. Uh, I'm, I'm studying these in my class assignment. Can I study those on your plant, on your property? So she's been studying those, documenting their growth and what to make seed and where they're successful in growing. And, and she has really taken on this project. Um, we applied for a Bass Bear Audubon Society mini grant, which enabled us to buy. She's actually, I'm sorry to interrupt. She's, not, she's one of the online listeners today. Just oh, she is. Oh, she's oh, listening. So Carolyn's listening. Okay. 
Hello, Carolyn. Uh, let's see, we um, that mini grant enabled us to put uh, wire fencing around two of our diversity plots. By this time, the plastic fencing had deteriorated and it wasn't there anymore. And we we went out where we knew there were some remnant stands. Again, we're following the process that worked many years earlier when we go out, find remnant stands of native plants, collect the seeds, plant them in trays, and um, and then transplanted them to these diversity plots. So we had two fenced in diversity plots and an, a, an area where we had had success simply by putting the plants in among cactus and other brush similar to the environment where we have seen them living in, in nature. So we have three types of environments, uh, locations where we've planted these plants. Here's Carolyn, when she first started the analysis, uh, she, she found where we had put these initial plants, put cages around them to further protect them from deer. And these are the trays that we planted. Um, we, we collected enough seed to plant 600 cells. Uh, she was working with the uh, let's see, National Butterfly Center who, that recommended that we see if we can't get 500 of these Manfredo plants growing because that, pop, that size population would be sufficient to support the giant Manfredo skipper, which as I understand it is a, an endangered species butterfly, which we may not even have any around anymore, but, but that's our goal is to have 500 of these Manfredo plants on the property. Here's uh, some volunteers putting up the fence that was uh, funded by the Fair Audubon Society. And we, we planted these little seedlings. Well, first of all, we built a fence in February and March of last year. April and May, we put the seedlings out, most of which are surviving. Here you see Carolyn identifying, identifying locations where we were to put plants in the cactus. We think what happens here is the cactus keeps the deer and other rodents out and they have half a chance to survive long term. And this picture was taken just before Thanksgiving where uh, Carolyn was out putting flags everywhere where there is a known live uh, seedling. So that, that this is, that's just part of a research effort. All right, about this time last year, an, an Alamo area master naturalist volunteer, uh, Teresa Craig, and she'd been volunteering on the prairie for quite some time. She noticed that we had a bunch of bird boxes out there, and we hadn't been doing anything with those bird boxes for years, actually. And she said, I'll clean out those bird boxes, and if you don't mind, uh, I'll start a nest watch program. Thought, wow, what is nest watch program? So she explained that nest watch is a program of Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's a worldwide worldwide project that that documents nesting birds all over the world so uh, so she set up that project and she became a certified nest watch leader uh, she wrote a proposal to the bear Audubon society for a mini grant got that award and that enabled us to construct 50 more bird boxes we had already 50 of them uh, that they cleaned uh, she cataloged all, it turned out to be 110 bird boxes on the 200 acres. And then throughout this nesting season last year, they monitored a subset of those 100 boxes. And this is what that project looked like. In December of last year, I think we had 15 volunteers that day, got about a half a dozen tables set up in the tractor shed, and we pounded away and made about 50 bird boxes. What was, one part that was really interesting was to clean out these old bird boxes. And here's an example of one that probably had three different nests, probably three species of birds over a period of time. Um, so all of this was documented as a part of Nest Watch. And then the actual monitoring was done with boroscopes. They reached out and they looked inside the little camera, took pictures of what was in there. The whole idea being to document nest construction, uh, laying the eggs and, and, and the babies that hatch, uh, counting how many predators ate and how many actually survived and, and fled. So that was nest watch, and I hope they keep that going year after year. We have other special ongoing projects. Um, 
bird buyer blitz that we do three a year. Again, this was set up by volunteers, uh, Patsy and Tom England with Bear Audubon Society. Uh, some of you all probably know them. They're well known in the state. And uh, they started this about two and a half years ago. We do a spring, a fall, and a winter uh, bird buyer blitz. I, I think they've documented uh, 145 species now on the prairie. Uh, the, the place has become an e-bird hotspot on, uh, I think, Cornell Lab records. We do a general bio blitz every year. This started about two years ago by Peter Hernandez. Um, he was one of the officers, or still is, at the Alamo Area Master Naturalist. We, we schedule that to coincide with the City Nature Challenge, so we are a part of the San Antonio area town of all kinds of wildlife over about three or four day period. And one last project we just recently got underway is about a year ago, we learned that the farmhouse I grew up in was built somewhere between 1890 and 1910. We, we actually didn't know that. And so uh, what we, and I said pretty much shape, we figured out. And we, we figured we would restore that farmhouse as well. This is what a, a burden by a list looked like. I mean, we just have a great time. A group of people come out there and we count birds for a couple of hours. We have lunch and then people just roam around the prairie for the rest of the day. And we see birds like green jays. I didn't know a blue jay could be green, <laughs> but they can. We've never, we never saw these when I was a kid, but after restoring this, these green jays have been here for 10 years. They, they're now permanent. Well, um, and I mentioned earlier the Bob, the Bob White quail. You can get some great photographs. Come out looking at birds. And of course, the monarchs and all kinds of other flies come through with some of the native flowers. Uh, every once in a while, somebody discovers a new plant out there. This is an emery milkweed. Um, I'm told by naturalists who come out here, most of them have never seen an emery milkweed. And we have, we've not found several of them on the place. This is what the old farmhouse looked like when we, when we were told that was when it was built. We took some of the sheetrock off and some of the paneling off and we found all this fantastic mm -hmm. old wood and the, and the Mars, the uh, injuries left when somebody decided they didn't want a window, then they patched it up. So we're very far along now on restoring the farmhouse to the way it was like maybe a century ago. We, we want uh, students to be involved, we want to engage younger generations, because I'm not going to be around at least that much longer, and this has got to stay a prairie in perpetuity. So to accomplish that, we've gotten universities involved. These universities have had students out there with various type of projects. Baylor has had classes come out there that are studying ecological ethics. Texas Lutheran students have come out to collect prairie plants for their herbarium, library, whatever it's called, they had near the campus. UTSA has had two projects. It's graduate students uh, from UTSA have been documenting the recovery of plants after we've done a, a, a test burn. Um, Monarch Habitat is another group. One of the uh, instructors that actually the department did has had students out there doing Monarch Habitat studies. Texas State University, of course, the Manfredo Project. UT Austin and the PhD candidate studying the green jays. He's studying the genetics of green jays on our place because we are on the extreme north extremity of, of their range. We want to know something about the genetics of the birds. Um, and Texas A&M was to, was to start a carbon sequestration study earlier this year. Um, it came out, but then it didn't get funded, so that project was delayed for, for a year or two. And this is what some of these university projects look like. These are Texas Lutheran students collecting plants for their herbarium. These are some of the graduate students from UTSA that are counting the, and documenting the species that recover after the test burn. This is the PhD candidate who's trying to catch green jays. This is kind of funny because there's so many birds there. When you put this nest up, this net up, you can see all the birds that get captured, and the green jay is a smart bird. They fly up this olive tree just off to the left, and the green jay would stand and it would squawk away, but they wouldn't fly in the right head. <laughs>
And what are we doing to preserve and sustain the prairie? Well, we put it under a conservation easement with the Native Prairies Association of Texas, and we're engaging that next generation who can continue uh, and, and protect that prairie in perpetuity. We, we've set up a San Antonio chapter of the Native Prairies Association of Texas. Um, we have the student research projects. We conduct one or two workshops a year. These are all day workshops led by agency people, specialists in different areas of restoration. And these are on, always conducted on Saturday. We have volunteer work days on the third Saturday of every month. We've been doing that now for about seven or eight years. This gets people engaged, as you saw with some of the various projects that need to be sustained. And we will we'll conduct tours for other landowners who are interested in doing something similar. And I mentioned earlier, our we're leaving the our generation is leaving this in a financial this part in a financial uh, self-sustaining capability. It'll make it's making enough money to, to make to pay its basic bills. One thing I heard Chris Best say that, that I remember, he said, this restoration business takes a lot of patience and you have to be willing to keep trying even after multiple failures. Well, we certainly had successes, but we had failures along the way too, but you learn a lot from these, these failures as well. <clears throat> so with that, I'll turn the meeting back over. Um, you may want to put some dates on your calendar. Our next two work. Thursday work days are December 17th and January 21st. Our winter bird bio blitzes Saturday, uh, January 28th. Here's my contact information. If you want to keep track of what we're doing on the prairie, we frequently post on mostly on, on Facebook. Uh, just just get on Facebook, type in Kirchhoff Prairie, and then you can follow us. So with that, I'll, I'll try to answer any questions you might have. So, um, because our owl is over in the corner, let's, um, Kenneth, if you have a question, would you walk up to the owl or at least get close to the owl? And we have, we didn't have to put a tube in for him to get here, this owl. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'll, I'll come up by that owl here. Um, that fire break with the 2300 seedlings that you did and you got the the seedlings from l and l growers in san antonio do you have any recollection about what um species of trees you you purchased from them yeah the l and l growers is in the valley actually. oh they're in the valley yeah but i do have their address um <clears throat> i have a list of of the species each time we were recommended about 25 or 30 species, but but most are not commercially available. Now, when the first uh, fire break, we planted only 50, we could only buy 15 species. Two years ago, 23 species were available, but they were species like wire con, um, uh, black brush acacia, other kinds of acacia. But that's something I can email to somebody. That list. Why don't you email me and I'll okay. okay. Uh, I had I had a question um, about the the cattle. What are they grazing before they come on your farm? Because they they're still um, sending things through the digestive system that are that getting left on your on your property. That's a great question. Initially, for the first few years we did that, we had a quarantine area where the cows had to stay for 72 hours, clean out their digestive tract, so they were not bringing any plants on. <clears throat> but in, in more recent years, because there's been so much invasion, windblown invasion, that we didn't even stop doing that. Didn't, didn't matter. The cows probably take up mm -hmm. invasive plants on our prairie just like bringing them to us. On the on the nest watch, are they? Um destroy any any birds that that we don't want around like house sparrows we are not we were advised even on cowbirds we've seen some nests where cowbirds put an egg in there that's a natural event that's right. and nest watch says don't mess with that just leave them in there so that's what we're doing and we're we i've learned a lot from nest watch you don't just walk up to a bird box look in it and walk, walk back 
because other animals are watching. In, in fact, this is amazing. I had walked up to one bush. It was a wire time bush because I saw a sparrow fly out of it. And I looked in and there were four little babies. And I did what Nest Watch said. Instead of backtracking, I just continued walking on. Two hours later, when uh, Teresa Craig was there, I said, hey, there's a sparrow, there's a nest over here. What kind is it? We walked over there and all the babies were gone. And there was one on the ground. But what had, we're sure what happened is Green Jay saw me stop at that bush, look in it, and went on and they came and checked out that bush and hauled off three babies and dropped one on the ground. So there's all kind of protocol you learn in this nest watch on how to get the data you want, but not impact the, uh, the birds that are living there. Do you have any of your uh, surrounding neighbors interested in what you're doing and decide to convert their farms into prairies as well? Yes, there are. There's a, uh, a couple have 80 acres east of Floridaville, the Breaches. Um, about two years ago, they planted their property much like ours. And what's really interesting, they I bet they had three or four times as many species of plants in their seed mix as we had it. Because several years have gone by and growers are now producing a lot bigger variety of seed. So that's one example. The the fellow who whose cattle are on the next uh, on neighboring property also has property at both, and he's doing things on that property like managing his cattle there in a way that he can get native grasses to return. So he's doing it. We've had several others come out, look at the property, and I, I don't know what status all of them are in, but the answer is yes, some are. Okay, so if you have some small tracks, 200 acres, 80 acres, spread around, what's the odds that you're gonna finally get enough of them together to give you a prairie of say four or 5,000 contiguous acres? Yeah. Is that possible, you think? I, I think it is because there is documentation on that about the connectivity of disconnected properties. It really depends a lot on the animal and, and the seed on how far a bee, for example, can fly from one place to another to cross pollinate plants or how far an animal can, can move from one habitat to the next. Um, but the answer, I think, is yes. The, the San Antonio River Authority is very much interested in what you just talked about because they're trying to get additional properties in, in programs like ours along the, the San Antonio River watershed so that there is a, um, they have a word for that, something like kind of connectivity of these properties for various types of animals. Okay. Yes, sir. Come up to the owl, buddy. Yeah. You gotta come up to the owl. <laughs> uh, if a best naturalist or an Audubon Society member would like to do a little bird watching out there or something, is that possible or is it restricted? It's always locked, but okay. anybody can call us. In fact, on the eBird site where we are, a, um, a eBird hotspot. Mm. There's instructions there to contact me. Oh, great. To get uh, access to the place. Great. Yeah. And do you currently live on the property or do you live close to the property? I do in San Antonio, oh. but I go to the property two, two or three, mostly three times a week and I work there. I'm retired, so that's my fishing life. <laughs> <laughs> if I wanted to look at it on, uh, on uh, Google Earth or something, how do I find it? Yeah. You have a, I know how you, you have a lot or I do have longitude and latitude. I have those numbers and you can just put in the address and it'll zoom, zoom in. On. I will. Okay. Oh yeah. So the address is on the Facebook page. Let's see. I don't know. That's something else I need to send to you is the longitude and latitude of the farmhouse. Yeah. For anybody who wants the address is 1444 County Road 210. 1444 County Road 210. Floresville, yes. Yeah, you put that in and this will zoom. I, I've done that. Yeah, 1444 County Road 210, Floresville. 
Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sandy, do you have any questions online? I think most of the questions we would have had, you guys have already asked. But I will ask, can we make sure that we have the contact information and the work schedule? I don't know if we want to send that out in an email. Uh, just so people get a chance. Third Saturday. Yes. Yeah. Um, third Saturday. Third Saturday. Yes, I, I wrote down the, what was on that last slide, so I, I can get that out. Um, and okay. then. I can you email. were going to send me some of the, yeah. Yes. And, and we do have a word, a MailChimp. We have a MailChimp directory. So anybody that sends me an email address, I will put you in, in MailChimp. And then that automatically sends out notifications of events that we have. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. So if you want to get on that list, you know, email. Um, that yes. contact information, and I will also send that out. Can you also share the account? Marilyn yes. just posted. She. Yeah, you can have the PowerPoint. I mean, the PowerPoint can stay on this computer, and you share it. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Hey, Chris. Marilyn just posted in the uh, chat that she'll uh, include the information in the December newsletter too. Oh, good. And Great. Carolyn Thank put you. Carolyn put the. GPS coordinates in the chat. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. And I know, and I know you mentioned me. Anyone can donate to the the prairie if you so desire. So. Yeah, we're the prairie has to stand alone, both with donations or come out there and do some work. We accept any of that. Yeah. yeah. Do I do work? You get you get volunteer hours too. So. Are you a C three? I'm on C three. And we are not, but our tax guy said we could set it up. But he also has told us that you got to get your own advice. But he said you don't have to be a five hundred one c three. You donate to something like it. Just put it on 